Be the glory. Uh, God prevented some things from coming in your experience, closed some doors that you thought were good for you, and so whether good or bad, it's still a great week in the presence of the Lord. I'm so happy to be in God's house this evening one more time, because I know that God has prepared and provided a very special blessing, not just for me, but for all of us who are gathered in this place and for all those individuals who are gathered around their computers, watching the service via the streaming of Praise Vision. So we want to not only welcome those who are watching, uh, but we want to wish that you will receive the same blessing that we receive here in the house at Calvary. Uh, it is my delight again this week to introduce uh, this, the fourth speaker in this series of Experience the Hope 09. And our preacher this week is Pastor Jason Ridley. On tomorrow in the Divine Hour service, I will give an extensive biographical sketch of his ministry and uh, uh, talk a little bit about his uh, successes. But for tonight in introducing him, I just want to say uh, a few things. Uh, namely, uh, that he is a man of faith. Now, you may not understand necessarily why I say that, but you will understand when I tell you that uh, when I booked his flight to come here, we booked an early flight for him to land in New York City, in LaGuardia, at 8.05 a.m. Uh, this morning, when I was uh, circling the airport, I left a message on his phone to tell me when he uh, touched down, and uh, at 8.05, his plane landed. Uh, we decided that we were going to go to have some something to eat. So we went and we uh, spent a little time by IHOP and had some food. And we were just about ready to hit the road to Bridgeport. All in a sudden, the preacher started to complain that he was in severe pain. Now, I want you to hear me. When I say he's a man of faith, now hear me, he was in severe pain. I had to rush him to the emergency room. And he was in the emergency room today, not last week, not yesterday, today for seven hours. Now you're hearing me and I'm speaking very correctly. He was there for seven hours today. And I was with him. And uh, throughout the day, all I kept hearing from him was the faith that he will be standing to preach in this pulpit tonight. Are, are you with me out there? Now, now uh, not only did he say that he would be standing to preach the word of God by his faith expressions today, but his faith went beyond just standing to preach. For if someone is sick and in the hospital, at least they can say, I want an early release because I want to go preach. And they can still come and preach in their sickness and in pain. But the preacher was confident that God was going to heal him completely. Now, I wish you would listen to me. Completely. And he would not stand here tonight or tomorrow and preach with any ailment. So as we went and as we were there, uh, he did the CAT scan and it was discovered that he had a kidney stone. That was affecting him, and that's a very painful thing. And uh, at about, uh, right about 5 o'clock, Brother Preacher, we left New York. I called Elder. I told him that we need to pray for the preacher. I called Sister Sandra uh, Russell and uh, was asking her if, there, if we can find some concoction up here 
that can heal the preacher before he preaches. And uh, she told me that whatever, whatever, whatever cleansing that could be done, it's going to take three weeks. We didn't need three weeks. We need three minutes. And so we took the journey and he sat in the back seat of the car as we came up and he was obviously in pain. But all through the journey, I heard him speak. He was talking to his grandmother, whom he said, uh, she knows how to get a prayer through. She knows how to talk to God. These, these old people, that's, that's what he was saying in the back of the car. I was driving, and I was writing a sermon while I was driving, because I, I figured that he ain't going to preach tonight. Are you with me up inside here? And we traveled up. And we stopped along the way for him to re-energize himself, get some water and, uh, you know, get himself together. And as we journeyed, all he was saying was, I'm going to pass this thing before I preach tonight. This thing is going to come out before I preach tonight. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? We got to the hotel at approximately 7 o'clock tonight. He got his shower. Well, just before he got his shower, I heard him say, yes, sir. And he came out with that little strainer and he showed me the stone. What a mighty God. Nah, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. I said, what a mighty God. Mm. And somebody didn't hear me up inside here. I said, what a mighty God we are. Do you believe in him? What a mighty, powerful God we serve. Huh? So he's here. Stone gone. Holy Spirit on him. And we know we're going to have a good time. Because we serve a powerful God. I don't know about you, but I kind of feel that the devil didn't want us to hear what we're going to hear tonight. But God said, no, 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 no. You're not in charge. I, I am in charge. I am in control. And God touched him, healed him, and we're going to be blessed tonight. Now that's all I'm going to say about him tonight. That he's a man of faith. And God rewards the faith of his children. So after the song of preparation. Tonight we shall hear from the man of God. The pastor of the Berea Church in Charleston, West Virginia. And Shiloh in uh, Huntington, West Virginia. Pastor Jason Ridley. Hear ye the servant of the Lord after the song of preparation and meditation.
with us. Be still and know. Let the church say amen. The church say amen again. So glad to be in the house of the Lord. On this beautiful Sabbath day, amen. So thankful for your wonderful pastor. An awesome man of God. Pastor Ainsworth Keith Morris for allowing me this opportunity to stand before you uh, on your fourth weekend of the Experience the Hope uh, revival here at Calvary. Uh, me and your pastor, we were in uh, the seminary together and it was, it was a lot of us guys in the seminary but you know uh, when it came to preaching there was a pecking order at the top of that order there was pastor Ainsworth Keith Morris and on the next line it said everybody else a powerful preacher there were times when I would go sit in some of the preaching classes just to hear him preach uh, and I'm so thankful for his ministry and the awesome things that he's doing here uh, with you all here in Bridgeport Connecticut amen, amen. Uh, I have a confession to make tonight I want to be honest with you I'm not a very uh, versatile preacher. I'm very limited in what I can do. Uh, there's only one thing that I know how to do. And that's preach Jesus. And I hope for this weekend that that will suffice. Because I've seen how the word is true that uh, when I begin to lift up the name of Jesus, that he begins to draw all men unto him. 
I've seen how the song, uh, the hymn, the songs to the hymn is so true that uh, when I preach Jesus uh, and we begin to turn our eyes upon him and look full at his wonderful face, uh, then the things of earth will grow strangely dim. It's when we begin to look to Jesus, then those problems which seem so big, those obstacles which seem so insurmountable. The more we look at Jesus, the smaller and the smaller they get. To the point where it gets so dim that we don't even recognize it's a problem anymore because all we see is a solution. And that solution is Jesus. So I warn you now. I'm limited in what I can do. I preach Jesus. Is that all right? If you have your Bibles with you, I ask that you turn with me to the book of Numbers. What book did I say? It's the book of Numbers. I'm going to use this for them. It's the book of Numbers. Chapter 13. What chapter did I say? The book of Numbers chapter 13 and I'll read in your hearing let me get a little sound on this verses 25 through 33 that's the book of Numbers chapter 13 verses 25 through 33 let's stand as we honor God's word tonight when you have it say amen, amen. and the word of the Lord says and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit yes, of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Yes. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Well... But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Well. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. Yes. And there we saw the giants, mm -hmm. the sons of Anak, yes. which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, Mercy. and so we were in their sight. Yes, Let me sir. read it again. Yes. Yes, and there we saw the giants, yes. the sons of Anak, uh, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The next few moments, let us consider the message entitled, The Grasshopper Complex. Well. The Grasshopper Complex. Bow your heads with me now. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me now. Use me as thy anointed man servant to speak words of life in this your sanctuary. Lord, give me the strength that I need to persevere and make it through the rest of this day. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen. 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 
and amen. You may be seated. The grass hopper complex. Yes, sir. The children of Israel left Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. While they were there, the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, send out a man, a leader from each of the tribes, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am about to give to you. So the 12 spies uh, went out on a journey that will last for 40 days to see what the land was like, to see whether the people who lived there, were they strong or weak, whether they were few or many, to see if their cities were open camps or fortified cities, and to see uh, if the land they lived in, was it fat or lean, and if possible, to see if they could bring back some of the fruit of the land. And when the 40 days ended, they brought back to Moses and the others a cluster of grapes, which was so big that it took two men to carry it on a pole. The spies saw that the land was good. It was just like God had promised it would be. Don't miss that now. The spies saw that the land was good. It was just like God promised it would be. But we all know how the story goes for they did not go up and possess the land for the ten bad spies spoke to the crowd that they saw giants in the land and they became like grasshoppers in their own sight and so we were in ours, in theirs. They became like grasshoppers in their own sight. They did not go up and possess the land that was promised to them by the Lord because they had a grasshopper complex. But what is a grasshopper complex? What does it mean to have this kind of complex tonight? Well, in order to understand what it means to have this kind of complex, we must first understand what the word meant during that time. During that time, grasshopper was a Hebrew simile meaning helpless and small. So, in other words, to have a grasshopper complex, it means to have a helpless and a small mentality. It means to feel less of yourself. It's a defeated mentality. They had a grasshopper complex. And the bad news tonight is that there are a lot of people who have this same kind of complex even right here in the church. You have a lot of folk, uh, even some of our young folk, who have this kind of mentality. They feel helpless and small. They have a defeated mentality. However, there are two reasons tonight that I would like to suggest to us as to why we should never have this kind of mentality. First of all, we are the offspring of overcomers. We are the offspring of who? Our ancestors, they made it through the middle passage. They survived slavery. They had to deal with disenfranchisement. They had to battle with Jim Crow laws. They had to suffer through beatings and lynchings. They marched through segregation and yet and still they never gave up and they never gave in. And that's why you and I are here tonight. We are the offspring of overcomers. Now, the second reason is even more important than the first, and it's because we are Christians. And as followers of Christ, we should never have this helpless and defeated mentality when Jesus already has the victory in the palm of his hand and gives it to us. God is on our side, and if God be for us, who can be against us? 
We are victorious in Christ, but even though we are victorious, the reality is, is that many of us still have this grasshopper complex. So tonight we want to examine three mistakes. How many mistakes? Three mistakes that the Israelites made uh, which caused them to have this kind of mentality. And the first mistake that they made tonight that we oftentimes make is when you choose to be pessimistic over optimistic. It's when you choose to be pessimistic over optimistic. Oftentimes when we look at this particular text, uh, we deal with it in a way as if there was only one report that was given and that report was the bad report that the land devours its inhabitants and the men were giants in the land. But in actuality, the Israelites had a choice to make, for they had also received a good report from Caleb. He said that we should go up and possess and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But instead of heeding his words, they chose to follow the bad report. Instead of looking at their present situation from an optimistic viewpoint, they chose to look at it from a pessimistic viewpoint. The Oxford American Dictionary defines pessimism as a tendency to take a gloomy view of things or to expect that the results will be bad. They chose the negative report because they expected that the results would be bad. It's because of their grasshopper mentality. They had a helpless mentality. They believed the negative over the positive and these were the children of God. And the sad news tonight is that you have a lot of people right here in the church who face life's challenges with the same attitude. They expect that the results will be bad. How can any Christian live with this kind of grasshopper complex as if God has never done anything for you tonight? Young people, as you grow up in life, you are going to face problems and circumstances where you don't know what to do. And the only thing you can do is either look at that problem from an optimistic viewpoint or a pessimistic viewpoint. And what I want you to know tonight is that as long as you stay on the Lord's side, you can look at those problems from an optimistic viewpoint. You can look at them expecting that the outcome is going to be good because God is a good God and he's never failed you yet as a matter of fact he cannot fail you see the Israelites could have went up and possessed the land that day because God had already promised it to them if they would have had a different mentality about the whole situation but they missed out on their blessing because they expected something bad to happen unfortunately it's the same way with us tonight many people miss out on their blessings miss out on their breakthrough why because they don't believe that God has great plans and desires for them some people never get delivered from that issue or bad habit they are struggling with. Why? Because they don't think it can be overcome. Some young women, uh, some young women here is being misused and abused by some no good man. Why? Because she refuses to wait on God to send someone better because that's all she thinks she deserves. Some child is struggling in school, not because they are not smart enough, but because they think they can succeed. Somebody here refuses to go out and get a job and tries to blame it on the system, but in actuality, it's because they think they can't get one. Some young person here refuses to learn all they can learn because they think they might fail. Somebody here refuses to give their life to Jesus because they think he can't help them. 
Every day we miss out on opportunities because of our grasshopper complex. When problems and challenges come our way, we choose to look at them pessimistic over optimistic. The same problem that the children of Israel had, which caused them to have to wander through the desert for 40 years until a whole generation died off. Young people, when I went through my stage of depression, where I was always down, I had no energy, I had no desire to get out of my bed, I felt darkness all around me and darkness inside of me, it felt as if tons of bricks were being pressed down on top of my head. I didn't really care about things anymore. I went to class every day, but I was only there physically. Uh, sometimes I felt like throwing in the towel. I hated where I was at at that point in my life, and it's all because I chose to look at my situation pessimistic where I expected the bad to happen. And it wasn't until one day when I decided that I was going to change the way I looked at my situation that I began to feel better. It's because I began to look at my situation optimistic where I expected the good to happen. And then I told the devil that he no longer had the victory over me and he knew he had no choice but to back up off of me because I'm a child of God and he has no authority over me. And the only reason he could depress me was because I allowed him to. You see, he can only do to us what we allow him to do. And when we live with a pessimistic mentality, where we always expect the bad to happen and the worst to happen, we give him the opportunity to discourage us and keep us from succeeding and ultimately keep us from following Christ. That's why as Christians, we must choose to be optimistic in every situation. Are you hearing me tonight? And this second, this second mistake that they made, y'all don't mind, I haven't been feeling too well, so I'm a little warm up here. This second mistake they made, which we oftentimes make, which causes us to have this grasshopper complex, is when we allow others to dictate how we feel about ourselves. Stay with me now. I tell you tonight, you can never allow others to dictate how you feel about yourself. And unfortunately, this is another mistake that the children of Israel made that caused them to have this grasshopper complex. It says it right here in verse 33. There also we saw the Nephilim and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They allowed what the spies said about them to be the way they felt about themselves. And it's because they felt that way about themselves that they felt helpless and incapable of possessing the land. It got so bad that in chapter 14, which is a continuation of the story, it says that the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and wept that night. They even grumbled against Moses and Aaron, even began to think that it would have been better for them if they had died in Egypt or had died in the wilderness. If you read down a little further, you will see how they wanted to make plans to appoint a new leader uh, that would lead them back to their oppressors. It's a shame that they would rather go back to bondage instead of being free because of what somebody else said they were and they believed it. And the bad thing about it is that those ones who are doing the talking know exactly what they are doing. For example, here in the text, the spy's self-description as grasshoppers is a figure of speech called meiosis, which diminishes one thing to increase the size of importance of another. They distinctly use the term grasshopper to make the Israelites feel more inferior and to make them feel as if their enemies were more superior 
and the bad news is they fell for it and the bad news is is that some of us are still falling for it today young people that's why I want you to always remember today that as you continue to grow up in life never allow anyone else to dictate how you feel about yourself because some folk will try to tear you down or uh, will try to destroy your confidence and I'm not talking about people just outside the church because you got some folk right up in here who will tear you down as a matter of fact uh, if you look at verse 2 of chapter 13 you will see that the men who were chosen to spy out the land were leaders from each of the tribe they were the so-called church folk uh, they were the so-called Christians who told them that they were nothing but grasshoppers you see this is how the devil works sometimes he will use people to try to discourage you somebody here knows what I'm talking about they are the ones who's always saying you'll never make it you come to a meeting with some great idea it'll never work we are not able to do that you will never amount to anything trying to discourage you. But when you really think about it, most of the time, the individual who's doing the talking, who's trying to bring you down, trying to make you feel less about yourself, in actuality, that is the way they feel about themselves. And because they feel that way about themselves, in order to make them feel better, they want you to feel that way about yourself. Uh, it's right here in the text. The ten spies told everyone we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And it's because they felt like grasshoppers, because they felt helpless and small, because they felt incapable of possessing the promised land, then they wanted everyone else to feel that way about themselves. I know something about people trying to dictate how I should feel about myself. I've had pastors, yes I said pastors, who told me that I would never make it in the ministry because I didn't go to Oakwood and because I didn't come from a pastor's family but I didn't let that discourage me and I didn't let that get me down because or cause me to change the way I feel about myself because I know who I am and more importantly I know who I am in Jesus Christ when you allow someone else to dictate how you feel about yourself you allow that person to have control over you because you only feel and believe uh, what they tell you young people the only person you can let control you is God because it's in him that we live move and have our being if they would have just let God lead the way they wouldn't have had to worry about the bad report that the ten spies gave because they would have already known uh, who they were and what they were capable of accomplishing through him. But instead they settled for what the spies told them they were and as a result they settled for a grasshopper mentality. Young people, you may come across a teacher so-called family member or friend maybe they're your boss or co-worker and they feel less about you than they should and they may try to make you feel that way about yourself but I want you to always remember tonight that you are a child of the king and because you are a child of the king then that makes you royalty that means you are worth something as a matter of fact you are worth so much that Jesus Christ was willing to give up everything to come down to earth and die for you know who you are tonight and this third mistake that they made, which we oftentimes make, which causes us to have this grasshopper complex, is when we look at our situation and leave God out of the equation. It's when we look at our situation and leave God out of the equation. We all know that in Genesis chapter 12, God made a covenant with Abraham. And part of that covenant was that 
he would make Abraham into a great nation and his descendants would be given the land of Canaan. Now fast forward to the Exodus as the children of Israel are about to depart Egypt after hundreds of years of bondage. And because of the oral tradition, their history was passed down from one generation to the next so that they were well aware of the land that God had promised them. And when they left Egypt, they knew that that is, that that is where God was leading them. And if you need an example, just flip over a few chapters to Numbers chapter 10, verse 29, where you will see Moses asking Hobab to come with them as they go to the place which the Lord said he would give to them, for the Lord has good promises concerning Israel. So it's mind-boggling tonight to see them make it all the way to the outskirts of the promised land and then forget about God. When the spies returned with their report, nothing is ever mentioned of God's power or God's promise. But instead, all they focused on was who was in the land and the fact that they seemed bigger than them. And it's because God was left out of the equation that they felt that they could not obtain it. And the reason is because unbelief always sees obstacles, but faith always sees opportunities. And the mere fact that they left God out of the equation shows that they were unbelievers. And that's why instead of seeing their opportunity, they saw an obstacle. And the frightening thing is that you have a lot of folk who come to church every week who are just like this. When problems come their way, come their way, they see obstacles instead of opportunities for God to move in their lives because when they face that situation, they leave God out of the equation. That's why you have so many depressed and stressed out folk in the church. People who are tired and worn out, unhappy, sad all the time, ready to give up. You even have young people who contemplate suicide, some of them who actually commit it. Young people who are ready to give up, so they turn to destroying their bodies through drugs and alcohol, thinking that it will take all the pain away. Some young women selling their bodies, thinking that this is the only way out, when the only way out is Jesus. But the problem is that when they face life situations, they leave him out of the equation, and they end up with a grasshopper complex where they feel helpless and small. They feel as though they They've been victimized when in actuality they are the ones victimizing themselves. Young people, that's why, uh, that's why it's so important that when you face tough situations in life that you keep God in the equation. For you see, your situation may show that you are broke, but with God in the equation you know that he will provide. Your situation may show that you're lonely and sad, but with God in the equation, you know that he is a comforter. Your situation may show that the adversary is all around you, but with God in the equation, you know that he that keepeth Israel never sleeps nor slumbers, and he is a strong tower. Your situation may show you lack direction, but with God in the equation, you know that he will direct your paths. Your situation may show that you're burdened and worn out, but with God in the equation, you know that he is a burden bearer. Your situation may show that you are struggling in sin, but with God in the equation, you know that we have an advocate named Jesus. If they would have only kept God in the equation, they would have known that they were able to possess the land through him. But the problem is that too often when times just look like they are about to get rough, we forget all that God has done for us and thus we get so easily discouraged. Just look at the Israelites. They were fine while the spies were spying out the land. They were very confident. But as soon as those spies got back and told them that it was impossible for them to take the land, they left God out of the equation and forgot all that he had done for them. 
They forgot how he delivered them from Egypt. How he parted the Red Sea for them to cross. How he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. How he provided manna every day and how he provided water from the rock. No matter what situations are thrown your way in life, remember to always keep God in the equation. As a result of their choice, to be pessimistic over optimistic and as a result of them allowing others to dictate how they feel about themselves and as a result of facing life's situation without God in the equation the children of Israel ended up with a grass hopper complex they felt helpless and small and that they could not succeed and as a result they had to wander around the desert for 40 years until a whole generation died off but the good news is today somebody say the good news the good news is that after 40 years had ended the children of Israel did go up and possess the land for they were more than able to conquer it it's all because they served a mighty good God the same God that I serve today a God who sits up high but he rules down low a God who spun worlds into existence a God who fights for his children a God who never turned his back on me a God who's always there you don't have to be pessimistic you don't have to worry about others you don't have to face life all alone you don't have to feel helpless. You don't have to feel defeated. For God will stand with you. God who laid aside his divinity and wrapped himself up in my humanity. God who laid aside his home and came down to my home. God who laid aside his righteousness and bore my filthiness. God who laid aside his power and felt my weakness. God who laid aside his life and died my death. I'm talking about Jesus. He'll stand with you. He'll fight your battles. Won't he do it? He did it for me. That's why I can stand here today and tell the world I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. I thank God today, cause he's always near. When I'm down and out, he's right here. When I can't see my way, he's right here. When I feel helpless, he's right here. When I feel defeated, he's right here. Problems in my home, he's right here. Problems on my job, he's right here. When I feel all alone, he's right here. He's a right there God. When Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, he was right there. When the three Hebrew boys were thrown in the fiery furnace, he was right there. When Peter started sinking, he was right there. When David fought Goliath, he was right there. When the Israelites were trapped by the sea, he was right there. 
Won't he be right there? Won't he be your bridge? Won't he fight your battles? Won't he give you the victory? Won't he give you joy in sorrow? Won't he give you hope for tomorrow? Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he? Ain't he all right? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, ain't he all right? Say he's a mighty good God. How sound your neighbor and say he's an awesome God. It's because of God that I'm here today. You ought to stand to your feet and give God some praise. The devil is already defeated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. have to have a grasshopper complex no matter what obstacles you face in life tonight you don't have to look at that obstacle pessimistic anymore because you know who's on your side, amen? That's why in spite of how I felt laid up in the hospital, I could claim the victory because I know who's on my side. You don't have to worry about what others say about you. The only person who matters is Jesus, and you know how he feels about you. And when you face life situation, I'm so glad to do tonight that I don't have to face it all alone. Because I know in my feebleness, I'll fail every time. But there's somebody I can lean on. There's somebody who is right there with you. And the good thing about Jesus being right there with you is because sometimes, most of the times, problems just sneak up on us. But even though it may have caught you off guard, off guard, God already knew. And he already had a solution. You're standing to your feet. And there's someone here tonight. going through life with a grass hopper complex. And your life has been messed up as a result of it. 
in and out of bad relationships with the wrong person. Because you don't realize God has something better. Allowing others to dictate how you feel about yourself. Pessimistic about everything. Not knowing that you are an overcomer in the name of Jesus. And thinking you have to go through life all alone. You can lean on Jesus. You don't have to have that kind of mentality. And you want to say, Lord, I don't want to think like a grasshopper anymore. I don't want to live like a grasshopper. I don't want to act like a grasshopper. I don't want to be like the children of Israel and miss out on what you had in store for me. Because of my grasshopper mentality. That's you tonight and you're standing. We want to have a special prayer tonight. To deliver us from that kind of thinking. To deliver us from that kind of mentality. To deliver us from that kind of thought process. And from this day forward to put all of our trust in Jesus and Him alone. We're going to have special prayer right now. And I'm going to ask your pastor to come stand beside you. And if you're standing on the lower level. And in the balcony. I want you to come down. My brother continues to say is 
rough When things are tough Lead on Jesus One more time because somebody else is there singing, learning. Somebody else needs to come. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you tonight. Tells you this is your moment, this is your time. Time to lean on Jesus. Learning. the Spirit moves upon you. You know that oftentimes you have had that grasshopper complex. Mm -hmm. Thinking less of you than God wants for you to think. Somebody has told you something bad about yourself and you started believing it until it became true about you. Be delivered tonight. Be delivered. God is here. God's true is in the deliverance business tonight. Is there somebody else? There's somebody else. In this moment of prayer, somebody else who wants to come forward. We want to pray. Since I've turned aside for pleasure Let's come Regain your confidence tonight. And it has gone Regain your confidence. God bless you. God is in the healing business. Is in misery. I confess. One more. God bless you. Take me back. Oh Lord. And try. Somebody else. Somebody else with Jesus. Somebody else needs to be saved. Somebody else needs to be delivered tonight. Who is that person? Oh, resist your deliverance. Spirit of God wants to take your hand, but you must stretch your hand first. Who are you? Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Don't be nervous. seconds that 30 seconds enough time for you to move come you know this is the time for you to say yes Lord we're gonna pray in 15 seconds you feel that you are the person who should come 
you are. So come. defeated there is no doubt in our minds that we serve a mighty God you have given the victory to us you have delivered Canaan unto us you have granted our victories to us ahead of time Yet, Lord, we have caused on many occasions the devil to tell us that we are grasshoppers and we cannot possess that which you have already given to us. Tonight we were reminded through your servant that you should not be left out of the equation. Because you who made us, you who provided for us thus far, you who presented several testimonies in days past, you are not abandoning your power. You are still in the miracle business. And so although at times, Lord, we may feel down and out, we may feel depressed, we may feel low down in our lives, you are reminding us tonight that your power cannot be matched by the evil one. Thank you, Lord, for demonstrating that today in raising your son from a hospital bed, bringing him to this place where he could preach this powerful word tonight. Oh, Father God, we thank you. For those who believe that miracles were for days gone by, Lord, we can testify tonight that you are still a God of miracles. And if you have done it for others, Lord, each of us tonight can stand with assurance. If you have done it, you can do it for us. And so now, Lord, this moment right now, here standing at the altar are individuals who want for you to do something in their lives. I ask you upon the authority of your word, upon that which you have already spoken, you, Lord, listen to yourself speak. Listen to yourself tell us that no good thing will you withhold from them that walk uprightly. It's not us talking to you God you said those words and we hold you to your words and we know that you never change and so Lord we claim the blood of Jesus Christ tonight that blood that will never lose its power that blood that will wash us and make us whiter than snow that blood that will enable us to walk righteously Lord and as we walk righteously Lord may we walk in the path of your blessing forgive us where we have come short blot our sins out give us a new slate and oh heavenly father I pray for that heart that has been changed and transformed as a result of your word tonight. As these your children go to their homes, may the thought and may the words that you have spoken tonight remain in their minds. May they see you at work, removing stumbling blocks, 
breaking down barriers so they can step forward for you. For those of us who have already given our lives, oh Lord, we stand in a moment of recommitment because we too, Heavenly Father, we have listened to the lies of the devil. Raise us up. Lift us up. Stand us up. And may we ever live in your presence knowing that you will do for us more than we can ask. More than we can think. Now Lord, how could I close this prayer without one more time placing your manservant into your hand? been on the road for more than 12 hours the hospital bed seven hours he needs to be rejuvenated so that he can preach on the mark clear his mind clear his body fit him and fill him for service so that on the morrow when we shall come again in your house we shall hear you speaking through him one more time. Oh, Heavenly Father, we will be prepared for your soon and glorious coming. So now, Lord, take us home safely. Give us a good night's rest. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, love of the Father, sacrifice of the Son, presence and power of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us now. Without him.